All right, then let's really call the meeting to order. Do it. Um, and uh, uh, our agenda starts with meeting minutes um, to review and approve the meeting minutes from April 29th. Uh, John or Fred, do you have any uh, comments on the minutes? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Fred? Fred, are you muted? Fred, Fred, you're muted. Yeah, can't hear you. Okay, uh, motion to approve the minutes of April 29th, 2020. Second. All in favor? John? Yeah. Fred? Yes. Joyce? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, second item on the agenda is the vendor and payroll warrants. Um, there's uh, a couple of them, I think, this week, if I'm looking at the right agenda. Yep. Um, do you have any comments or on those? No. No. Okay. All right. Great. Um, next item on the agenda is public comment. This is the time for comments from the public related to items that are not listed on the agenda. Uh -oh, and I, I don't know I from actually... just names who might be members of the public um, with I something to say here so definitely unmute yourself and speak up if you're a member of the public who has um, something to say okay okay i'm not seeing anybody frantically unmuting their microphone or trying to talk and not being heard so i'm going to go to the next item which is our public hearing um, we have a public hearing, a petition from Eversource to install utility poles and three regulators on Long Plain Road. Um, I guess I will turn it over to Brian since he probably knows who to chat with first. Sure, this will be Michael Rosenberg from Eversource. Um, he's virtually here, I think. I uh, see a Michael Rosenberg down here. He's yes. Here. Yeah. I am here. I'm uh, I'm in the kitchen feeding our two-year-old, so that's why I'm not on camera. Okay, but there it's open to the public, Michael. So it's really okay. Do you want me to take it away? Is that yep. best? Okay. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay. Just want to check that. Fine. All right. Perfect. So we had um, we have gone through the petitioning process for this one a few times. Um, you know, we've talked to the residents out there, um, particularly um, Miss Robleski. Robleski, sorry about the pronunciation. Um, we've gone back and forth a few times since our original petition, and we came down to a uh, I think a good location. It ends up being on uh, one side of her property, um, close to the guardrail area. So mm -hmm. it's a replacement of that existing pole and then the installation of a new pole about 18 feet southwest. Um, so that would be the regulator platform. And we are also petitioning for a new pole north of the guardrail. And that's to have the... Um, Hold on one moment, sorry. Um, that's to have the, the distribution line continue tangent um, after the regulator, right? We don't want to keep a, we don't want to put a corner on one side of the regulator across the street. So we're proposing a new pole. Um, this is uh, something else we reviewed in the field. Um, the proposed solution, and it, it does escape me the resident's name across the street, but this is one of the, the favorable locations that they had. Um, it kind of, moved it north, um, further away from their driveway, further away from the view of the home. Brian, has, Brian, has that a butter been notified of this hearing to, to? Yes, they all have been. This has been, they've been. Yeah, I'll, if it's okay, I'll jump in. We've, we've, we kind of got creative. We did some phone blasts. Um, I did some emails with Miss, uh, you know, Roblowski, just because mm -hmm. being a non-resident, right, we didn't have the exact address, we just have the property address. So we, I think we jumped through a lot of different steps to, to notify and 
you know, get the word out during this time, right? We're kind of all pivoting to the new situation. Um, Kathleen, do you have anything you'd like to add? So, so when is this work going to start or? I know Honestly, at this point, I'm not sure. You know, I would think in a, I would say within the next two months, but our whole, our whole work process is different now, right? We're kind of taking a step back, concentrating on emergent work, immediate customer service work. So okay. some of our capital projects, we're still continuing with the design, the permitting, the permissioning, but we have to be really careful on basically how we use resources, right? When we do some of this more difficult capital work, it means more people in closer proximity. So we're kind of, we're waiting a lot of things out to see when we can really get back to, you know, working safely. I mean, I guess we're all continuing to work safely, but we don't want to put people in positions right now where, mm -hmm. you know, you've got five people working on a poll. We don't, we don't want to do that. So. Okay. No, I, I think, uh, Mike, we've walked through that. So, you know, I understand the options and this is probably the best one. So, um, you know, I just wanted to listen in case something changed or I didn't understand anything, so. Nope, similar to what we had talked about. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it, I think it's a good compromise for everyone. It compromises, or it um, kind of accommodates you as the property owner. It does move it away from that town parcel as yeah. well, right? If anything's there, that flag lot entrance, it moves it farther away from the, uh, mm -hmm. The resident across the streets kind of kitchen view that we had talked about so i think i think it is the best option um that we can come up with okay all right hey mike dare i ask will once these polls are cited will these impact and and, and forgive me there are so many poll sightings that impact different facets of town i apologize for getting them confused but will will this sighting possibly be connected to the connect connection of one of the solar fields um so this one is not directly dg related um this one is purely for distribution customer benefit um okay. the river road is a combination of both right because we're we're compensating for the dg you know, the distributed generation associated, we're also benefiting customers through that. So this one's purely customer benefit. Okay. Anything we install for a DG project is both DG and customer benefit, right? Because if they're gonna if they're gonna create a disruption with the voltage, it will affect a customer. So installing that regulator is to a customer's benefit as okay. well. I just thought I'd swing the bat. Thanks. Yep. Mike, uh could you update us the status of, of the other two locations you're working on in town, the River Road one and uh, Christian Lane is a little different now, but you're doing some work on Christian Lane. Uh, are these completed or if not, when do you expect them to be completed? So with River Road, um, and I, I think this was a, a, I would say a misstep on our siting. It ends up being directly adjacent to a storm drain and a direct, a directly adjacent to a stream, right? Or river, stream, whatever it's classified as. So I'll be honest, we're re-looking at that location. We're not the most comfortable with where it is in proximity to the water, in proximity to the storm drain. You know, we've, we've talked about internally of, you know, maybe we approach the town about relocating the storm drain, right? You know, at our cost, um, however that works, but we, to be honest, that one's on pause. We're, we're really looking at it. We don't want to put something up that'll have a negative impact. Um, regarding Christian Lane. So that one, I, I think we ran into some, some concerns with how we had originally looked at petitioning because we'd be, we'd be taking up a large chunk of that individual's frontage, right? Next to the, we'll call it, trail and a house on the hill right like and if that ever became developable like it, it really does create an issue for access so we took it back to engineering we really dissected the need and the size of the regulators 
and we ended up downsizing the regulators to a single pole application and splitting them. So while it is three, you know, transformers on three poles, they're not the larger ones. We're not utilizing the platform. We're not creating this, you know, 18 foot structure out there. Um, so utilizing existing plant, um, we thought was just the best way to, to ease resident concern, right? Because we're not gonna, we're not gonna look to petition. We're not gonna block essentially, you know, 25 feet of that frontage area. You know, it, we just, we took it back and we tried to find a workaround that, that would work. Um, and this is, that's what we came up with. Whether it's done or not, to be honest, I'm not sure. Um, I barely left the house in eight weeks um, and I haven't really looked at that one from like a reporting perspective where the job is. Um, but that's where we are with that. Mike, to get back to the River Road one, if my memory serves me correct, that I thought the new poles are already in the ground there. Uh, and the second point is our uh, highway superintendent was there when we were, when you, you or your crew were, were locating where to put the poles and he identified where the storm drain was. And, and uh, I think the agreement was you could, you could avoid it, the, the storm drain by moving it one way or the other. So I, I thought that the issue of the storm drain, we already addressed with, with, with your staff uh, can you comment again? I, I think there's two poles there already. That's... So, so the poles were set um, where they are in specific, you know, location related to the storm drain. I'm not sure. Um, you know, we had, we're taking a look at that in response to the installation crews concerns. Um, I'd have to do more research to see where the poles are in relation to the storm drain. I, I, I don't know. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I just don't have an answer at that moment, at this moment for that. Can I ask a quick question? Sure, go ahead, Kathleen. You mentioned an, another situation that I remembered when I first was there in October, um, and you are now putting these regulators on individual poles rather than a platform. Could that have been done on Long Plain then? No, so what? The exercise was done. So the, the regulators are sized based on the amperage of the circuit and the wire on the circuit. So where the Christian Lane regulators fall, the wire actually gets smaller. So the regulator amperage decreases the requirement. It was right on the edge and we kind of looked at it from a a future state perspective, you know, what did we see for load growth down there? Would we end up needing to install new conductor? Um, un you know, unfortunately for your location, that is a major backbone for our system. Um, it kind of, it, it feeds a lot of locations. So it's, it's not some, it's not a location where we could downsize these regulators. And to be honest with Christian Lane, I think we were just lucky it landed where it landed because we don't have we don't have any other situations with any of the regulators where we could downsize we we've looked at them believe me we've we've tried to find every workaround to the platforms and the, to mitigate the um you know to mitigate the installs we just that's that's honestly the only location that it worked we looked at yours as well it just didn't unfortunately um it didn't work out uh, uh uh, Jared? Yeah, hi, Michael. Uh, good to have you on the phone. Um, this is Jared Glansberger. I and uh, John Hanmer are interested in um, a cannabis cultivation operation on uh, Seven River Road. Um, was just looking at the Google Maps uh, view of the um, lines that run by us, and it looks like it's single phase right now. was curious if you could speak to the possibility of bringing three-phase power down to Seven River Road from approximately North Farm. It's a little south of North Farm. Um, not really prepared to speak on that. You know, I would recommend if you're interested in new service, um, yeah. I'll tell you the same thing we tell every customer. Um, you know, our website does have the customer service request um, yep. information. 
your best bet is to open the customer service request. A service technician will look at that project with you. Um, you know, it's basically my group handles capital projects, um, so it. sort of larger build outs. If there's a meter attached to it, it falls with a different group and we need that service request pulled. So, got it. Um, but they could go over that with you and kind of great, kind of high level. Great. Thought there was a good opportunity to chat with somebody while we had you on the phone. Yeah. I, I don't have the number offhand, but if you go to the website, um, there's a very easy way to get in touch with customer service and open the work. With Thanks. Customers. Appreciate it. Yep. All right. I would um, uh, like to hear from anybody else who has something to do with the poll hearing matter at hand. Um, if you have other questions for uh, Eversource, you'd have to like call them not during our hearing on the polls. Um, I see there's a few names here that I don't all recognize. Is there anybody else here who would like to address the, the uh, polls on um, uh, Long Plain Road, the polls and regulators? I guess, uh, let me just say one other, one other thing uh, about the existing locations that are kind of in limbo and, and we didn't really get a definite answer as to when they would be uh, completed. And even on, on this new one, uh, I guess to maybe a question to the other, the board here, should we be asking for some kind of status report in three months, six months, tell us what's going on? Or, or, or uh, I guess it just doesn't look good to have all these installations uh, around town that aren't completed and yet we're adding more. I, I mean, where's, where's the town's control on this? I mean, this could drag on for a while. I don't know, Joyce or Jonathan, what do you feel about that? Are you saying as it relates to the solar fields, Fred? Or I'm, I'm no, listening. no, I'm, you know, these, these locations where they're putting the poles in. Well, I mean, I, you know, I don't, think any, I don't think it's any surprise that I, I, I find this whole installation process not exactly magic. Um, I, I think it's, it takes too long a period of time and I'm not sure it's planned appropriately and I, I've always expressed my frustration that there doesn't seem to be any any communication between um, the the organizations vested in poles being placed, uh, not to mention with the with the neighbors and the butters. So, I, I, Fred, I think we we can't stand in the way of if there's a need, there's a need, but I think we can require or at least strongly encourage some communication strategy and and plan outline so that there is at, at least a self-imposed timeline on the part of the different utilities that are part of this. I, I, I never see any, I, I never see a, a, a timeline, you know, when do we hope this is finished? If, if I run a business, I want to know when a project's going to be done. And if it's not done by the time that, that, that uh, was forecast, I want to know why not. And I never see that. So I guess that would be my only take on it. You can't stand in the way of, of, of need, but am, yeah, I, am I, I missing something? I, I, agree, I agree with you, but I guess these locations are starting to look ugly. And yes, I guess maybe more for the, for the neighbors, you've got, you got poles all over the place, double poles, the ground is disrupted and all. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know, it just seems... It, there's no, I hate no follow up, no. So if I could re reword it, you want to find a way to um, address that, you know, maybe these like forgotten poles right. um, that are, when they put in the new pole, the old pole is still there, needs to be removed, and that doesn't get removed in a timely manner. Um, and uh, is there uh, a way in this pole hearing process that we could do something about that. I don't know the answer to that question, but it sounds like good communication is part of it. So, um, so I would, from a first step, I can tell you that um, I spoke with Melissa Hancock earlier, um, community relations representative about this. So she wasn't able to attend, um, but she did mention, you know, if there's, if there's a required need for more communication, more touch, 
you know, sort of touch points between, you know, you as the town and us as the, the um, utility that she would definitely be willing to help. So I can ask her to get in touch with Brian um, and kind of status these projects for you, um, status them on a, you know, if it'd be a, mm -hmm bi-monthly right i mean if you meet twice twice a month you know a status in advance of that um and then i will also say that you know let's say regulators aside if if there's ever a double pole issue or you know just double pole somewhere right um she's always a good conduit because she can refer that to the operations group they can check the pole see if it's ready for removal um you know a lot of times with those double poles and we we kind of luck out because we transfer first and then it goes to the communications group um, whether it be charter comcast verizon you know they have a certain time frame where they do their work and then it goes to the next party and then they notify us and then or i'm sorry then they notify verizon verizon moves a poll so um we can definitely try to triage those on a case-by-case -case basis and like i said i can have her provide a report out regulator wise to the board and to Brian and that works. But, but Mike, are, is there a schedule involved? I mean, it would, what, there has to be for every, let's call it an individual project, there has to be a, a calendar attached. This is when this project should be done. This is when, this is the, this is the date where we need to notify butters. This is the date where, where the pole goes in the ground. This is the date where electricity is on. This is the date where old poles were taken down. There must be some kind of a timeline. And if there's not, that means they're just not, there's not adequate oversight. Well, so for, so for projects like this, um, right, being DPU regulated, the, I guess the easy answer is all of our stuff is due at the end of the year, right? Because it, it becomes a kind of a fiscal accounting perspective. Um, these regulators, we started on the petitioning path last summer um you know from a construction schedule i think a lot of those schedules were set aside until we could really nail down permission dates and approval dates right um i think we had a good outline of how we wanted to get these done um we had to pivot and and change our approach and we're kind of working to each point and then scheduling and moving forward um with the understanding that we the jobs moved from last year to this year so instead of having our december 31 date of 19 it's kind of december 31 of 20 but we don't want to go that far right we but we don't without the permission in place this one in particular right we don't know when we can start construction so we don't know when we're going to be able to finish those um i know it's not the answer you want to hear um well honestly it's kind of sounds like you're passing the buck I'm sorry. It kind of sounds like you're passing the buck. I got to admit. I'm not passing. I mean, I could tell you that the regulator should take three days to install. You know, there's three days to dig safe and that's what we plan by. Um, but we can't put it on the schedule until we have good, you know, good firm approval for the work. I, 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 and this isn't, this hearing is not the place for this, but I, I, I get that point, but you know, it, it the way you describe it puts the onus on the town that we didn't approve. And I would argue that a lot of communication pre-approval had never happened. And I think you've improved this a lot, don't get me wrong. If, 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 if this is a, a less than perfect system, it was a really less than perfect system before you came on board. Um, but, you know, part of, part of a process for approval is to make sure your ducks are in a row well ahead of the start of communication with the regulating authority. And I just, I've never thought that that happens effectively. So to, to just say, well, we didn't get approval makes it sound like you guys don't think you are, are part of that approval process running smoothly. Yeah, I, I think I would agree that this is not the best place to, to, to kind of have that conversation because we, we take ownership of not getting approval from an internal level. Um, you know, and we're working the process the best we can. So, I mean, I, like I said, 
I'd be happy to talk about this more. Um, yeah. I think we should. This isn't the place, but I agree. Well, thank you. Before we approve these, should we ask for more information and a schedule of what's going to be done with the existing locations and the new location before we act on this? No, I want to get this thing behind us. Yeah, I'd, I'd prefer not to. Uh, okay. To drag it out. <clears throat> uh, yeah. And we have no leverage to to get any kind of schedule or agreement to complete from uh, from EverSource. Well, I I think there's limited ability for EverSource to determine when Comcast will come and move their lines, and when Verizon will come and move their lines. So we can be the pain in the butt about it um, and have crappy electrical service. That, that's kind of what it comes down to for me. These improvements have to get made. Um, we, he's given us a number of somebody we can contact about the double poles and get more information from her about what the schedule looks like. Um, I, I don't see any need to spend more time on this hearing I don't think this is going to necessarily be leverage, I guess, is the other, is the way I look at it. I agree. Okay. So, I, I, Joyce, I'd like to make a motion, if that's okay. Okay. To, to approve the, um, the poll locations as cited by Eversource and in agreement with um, Abutters, uh, both, both here on this, in this meeting and, and those not here that, that we've heard about. So, oh, that's exactly. the right language. That's my motion. Okay, I'll second that. Um, all those in favor? John? Yes. Fred? Yes. Joyce? Yes. Okay, uh, then I guess I should close the hearing. This hearing is hereby closed. Thank you very much, Mr. Rosenberg, and say, um, hope uh, the rest of dinner goes well for you and your family there. Thank you very much. Thank you for the time. Um, I just uh, hope everyone stays safe. And uh, if anything does come up, feel free to reach out to me or reach out to me through Brian and I will follow up with Melissa um, right after this and she'll be in contact with Brian tomorrow. Thank you. That sounds great. Okay, great. And we're um, just a little bit late on our appointments. Um, uh, the next uh, item on the agenda is a scheduled appointment with John Hamner and Jared Glantenberg, um, and the name of their business is Debilitating Medical Conditions Treatment Centers, Inc. They'd like to discuss a request for permission to hold a remote community outreach meeting. Um, and this is as per a recently uh, adopted uh, Cannabis Control Commission regulation. They would like to introduce marijuana cultivation at Seven River Road. So I don't know whether to turn this over to Brian or to the folks from uh, Debilitating Medical Conditions Treatment Centers. Um, I can take it from here if, if you want. Um, okay. If that works for everybody. Sure. Do you got video? I do have video. I will turn that on. Okay. All right. So, um, <clears throat> I mean, that's essentially it. I mean, uh, there are two things we're hoping to essentially just bring to your attention. Uh, one of those was the um, recent uh, approval of having a <clears throat> online community outreach meeting. And the second thing we wanted to bring to your attention was um, we were looking to submit a draft of a host community agreement um, as per the requirements of your bylaws. Um, and so as far as a community outreach meeting goes, um, the first things first is um, we would need written approval uh, from you all to go through with this meeting. Um, and then there are other criteria that we can go over um, if you wish. I don't know if anyone has any questions in particular or what your thoughts are on us uh, conducting this meeting. Um, as far as our goals, uh, we did, <clears throat> we had everything scheduled. We sent out the outreach uh, for the meeting before, obviously, um, the COVID-19 happened and that, you know, made it unsafe to have um, meetings in large groups. 
And obviously the Cannabis Control Commission has come out with this new um, regulation. It's kind of new for everybody. Um, and uh, I guess we can, we can discuss maybe what our steps will be in the process if we go through the, uh, the meeting. Um, and if you have any questions for me right now or between yourselves, I guess we can sort of begin the discussion if that works. Okay. Um, so um, let's see. So yeah, the first things first, we would need written approval from you all. Um, we would need uh, the Cannabis Control Commission uh, suggested we have closed captioning um, and potentially liaise with an ADA coordinator uh, just to make sure the meeting is accessible uh, to everybody. Um, the notice, we would go through the same notification process again where we'd be sending out a uh, hard copy mail to all the abutters and all rev relevant um, government bodies. Uh, and that would also have the information as far as where we would conduct the meeting and how we would conduct the meeting. Um, our thoughts right now are that we would conduct the meeting through Zoom, through this platform. Um, we've been in touch with the realtor for Seven River Road to act as um, the, what is it? The head moderator. of the, essentially the moderator um, per CCC regulation. Our business, we're not allowed to be, to moderate the meeting, but we can set that up. Mm. Um, there are several other things, uh, but, Sorry. Just, uh, the last bit you said that you your your picture froze and the audio went away for a moment. Yeah. Okay. So I was just discussing the moderator that we have been in touch with someone to act as a moderator. Obviously, um, we would receive your input if you had any special requests for moderators. Um. Uh, we we would uh, have to post. Let's see. We would have all of our materials in PowerPoint. We post that at least 24 hours in advance. Um, we would need to figure out what would be the best uh, site to post that so people have access to electronically. Uh, I guess we could work with you all as far as how to move forward. It would essentially just be a PowerPoint presentation that we would make available um, for everyone to look at. And then we would receive questions. Um, most of the uh, questions would come to me probably through email and then I would have that list of questions that um, I would be obliged to uh, answer during the community outreach meeting. Uh, and then there would obviously be a component of the community, community outreach meeting where there's participation, there's discussion with people who are participating online where they would have questions and we would answer it. Um, the meeting would be recorded we'd have to submit the number of participants that were that participated to the Cannabis Control Commission. Um, and I guess that, that sort of sums up what the process would be for the community outreach meeting. Um, and we're wondering uh, what your thoughts are on us going through this process, setting up a date, having a Zoom meeting, uh, informing the town, obviously, uh, and what your thoughts are on us going through with that process. So would, would this be done in conjunction with Hatfield or is this independent, each town doing their own meeting? It would be each town doing their own meeting. Yeah, so um, okay. we would have a moderator. Uh, we would, the people who would specifically be involved in the meeting that we would be basically inviting the whole town government. And then we would be inviting the abutters uh, that were within 300 feet. And we would have a week's notice, at least a week's notice where we would publish in the local newspaper what we were doing. And as part of all the notice, we would obviously include the information on how to join the Zoom meeting. 
uh, and then 24 hours, at least 24 hours beforehand, we would have to post our PowerPoint presentation uh, for everyone to take a look at so that they could prepare questions if they needed. Um, and we would be receiving questions all the way up and, and through the meeting so that we can um, answer obviously the questions that you have. I guess that, I don't know if that answers your question as far as who would be attending the meeting. And, and Fred, just to clarify, I know there's another project that's right on the Wheatley Hatfield line um, with uh, Bernie Sp Smirowski. Um, we're separate from that. We're, we're just a, a Wheatley uh, oh. based project. Oh, oh, I thought you were on the line for both. Okay. Right. No, we're, we're just, we're just Wheatley. But, but some of your abutters are probably in Hatfield, aren't they? Uh, we're not, we're not on the line. I think we're just north of the line. So what, what address are you saying you're at Seven River Road? Correct, sir. Yes. Okay. And what do you, could you explain a little more what you're proposing to, to do there? Yep. So this would be a cannabis cultivation operation. Um, so um, we're looking to um, put up greenhouses um, to cultivate um, THC cannabis, um, somewhat similar to the Mustang uh, Wheatley Investment Group um, that's uh, up on Christian Road, I believe, um, and very similar to what, um, what Bernie is suggesting south of the uh, Wheatley Hatfield border. John, do you have some nope. questions? For now. Um, I had a quick question. Um, under notification, I, I, I think you said the first time through, like relevant government committees or boards would be notified. And then later, if I heard you right, you said that like all government officials, can you be a little more specific which, uh, which town boards are going to be um, notified of this public meeting? So uh, we would be we'd be inviting um, the select board, uh, police, fire. Uh, I mean, I guess with a smaller town, it sort of comes down to when I. It really just comes down to just pretty much inviting everybody. Uh, and I guess I don't have the exact specifications in front of me as far as who we would invite. We, um, there is some sort of, in, there's a little bit open to interpretation as far as relevant boards, but if I'm recalling who we invited before, it'd be police, fire, select board, department of health, obviously, um, Brian, you all, um, that's off the top of my head. Um, but there, I could, uh, if you'd like, there is the criteria spelled out. I could go through that and I could email you as far as what the criteria. Okay. I, I thought, I thought you might know off the top of your head, cause I have, I'm not as that familiar with this new ruling or this right. new. Okay. It's, it's still, yeah, all the, uh, yeah, all the criteria for the host community agreement before applies to the, um, online, uh, host community. Okay. And um, what do they specify about the moderator? You said something about the, the... It needs to be a third party moderator. So we, so essentially there'd be a third party running the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that you said like, be a real estate agent. So yeah. that would be a potential option. If you obviously, if you had someone in mind, if you guys wanted to run it, um, we'd sort of go along with whatever you wished to do along this I, front. I'm um, not sure kind of, we're in the business of running your meeting, but um, it, your real estate agent doesn't really seem like a disinterested third party. I, I don't know. If, I don't know if the law requires it to be a disinterested third party, but um, and that's what I was going to going to ask. Does this um, this new law um, or regulation, I guess, is the better uh, word for it? Does that what does that reg regulation require of the person? Like, what do they mean by third party? 
I have it here and I can read it to you. Oh, um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it says the applicant shall designate a meeting moderator. That individual shall not be uh, associated with the applicant, but may be associated with the host community. The moderator shall allow any meeting participant to offer questions or comments and allow for follow up questions. So this is um, the mm -hmm. person we're talking about is the representative of the lessor, not our representative. Um, and so in that sense, they're third party from us. Um, but as you point out, they have, a, they have a, an interest in this. Um, yeah. And as John is saying, we're open to suggestions as far as um, who may, you know, who may moderate this. I, I would like to suggest that if available, our town moderator would serve in that capacity. And I Lovely. say that because our town moderator Lovely. has experience moderating meetings, making Great. sure that all interested parties are, are, are listened to thoughtfully. Um, and, you know, and, unless the moderator has a reason to be biased, which we would obviously want to avoid. Yes. Um, then one way or the other, you know, with you guys or against you, who cares? Yep. Um, then we would want to avoid that. But but I think I, I think the townspeople, because it is an elected official, would have a certain comfort level of a, of a of a non biased perspective in the way someone would run a meeting. Great, appreciate that. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, all right. You could definitely do that as the moderator. That's perfect. I'm not sure the moderator is going to be willing to do that. I'm just throwing his head on the on the on the plank. <laughs> yes, yes. In um, failing that, uh, we'll, we can use uh, the person that we've spoken with, um, who who is a member of the community and seems to have you know familial ties um, in the community. Um, but yes, our, our, first our first preference will be for the town moderator and, and we'll follow up with um, town administration to, to get their contact and, and talk with them about that. Great, thank you. So we've already okay. reached that. Wait, before we go on, Joyce sure. and Fred, are you, are you okay with my recommendation or do you think I'm nuts? Well, let me, let me throw this out. Since FCAT's, I assume, gonna, gonna uh, be there filming the, the meeting, can they be the moderator? That, I would not. I would not be in favor of that. Because they're controlling the meeting, like this meeting. Well, I guess Brian and whatever. But okay, they're reporting. Yeah, I don't know that FCAT would be televising the meeting. I think it should be recorded for sure. But we could see it. Yes, and in fact, recording is part of the stipulation here. It needs to be recorded such that it could be replayed um, on mm -hmm. ca local cable access. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I just think, Fred, that they've got a job to do to make sure that the information is disseminated in a, yes. in a, in a professional manner, and they do a great job doing that. Um, I, I just don't think that that they have that. That again, I'm biased. I, I like the that our town moderator might do it if it, if at all possible. Okay. There's okay, a comfort level that the town has. Throw that out. That's fine. Great, great. So um, as we did before, we will notify the immediate. Butters. And just as a reminder, we had a date, I think, of March 23rd to do the community outreach meeting before all of this. Um, yeah. So we'll follow the same protocol, reach out to the abutters, um, make sure they all have the information to access uh, the meeting. Um, and as John was saying, follow up with the relevant town bodies as well. Um, we will, per Jonathan's uh, suggestion, follow up with the town moderator. Um, and as uh, John Hanmer was saying before, follow up with the uh, town ADA representative. Um, while, we're on the, uh, while we're on that topic, um, would you guys mind, uh, if you have this information, letting us know who that person is and how best to reach out to them? You mean, who is the town administrator? The uh, so the American with Disabilities Act representative, I, I believe, is who we're. Uh, oh. I, I chuckled when I saw that piece of it. It, it. it would be Brian Domino who just wears every hat. Okay, the, okay. The, the regulations are written written, assuming that every town is in Eastern Massachusetts and has yes. fifty thousand yes. people at a minimum yes. in the community, uh, with all these kinds of that. resources, which which is just ridiculous. <laughs> okay. Um, so Brian is the gear guy. Great. Okay. Um, so John, John will 
and yeah. I will we'll be in touch. Okay, that's great. Um, so there were two, um, two kind of uh, pieces to this. The first was this community outreach meeting. Um, we'd like to do it as soon as possible. Um, you know, I think John was saying that there needs to be a, a week of advance notice. Um, do, you, do you have any uh, objection to us sending that out this week for uh, a community outreach meeting next week? I w was the, wasn't the newspapers um, 10 days, Brian? Yeah, the newspaper will take a couple of days for, to process and then send out. So it used to be a yeah. week from when it's actually printed in the newspaper. Ah, okay, my mistake. So we'll need to give ourselves a little more than a week once we actually. I was remembering ten days, but that that could be uh, that. I don't recall off the top of my head. Yeah. That Thank might you. have been something else needed ten days notice Great. in the newspaper. Great. Thank Thank you for that. So um, let's just say as soon as possible is our interest. Okay. Do you have a target date at this point? Uh, I suppose if it's going to be ten days, then it would be the week of the twenty fifth. I would suggest it towards the end of the week. Great. Okay. So we'll shoot for the end of the month. Great. Joyce, can I, can I make a comment? Sure. Sure. Go ahead. So one of the one of the things that I found beneficial at at prior um, community outreach meetings it is the opportunity to to walk the site and kind of see. Oh, great. Thank you. Yes. Process. Uh, with the applicant. So that's a little bit diminished here. Is there something that can be done? In, yes. For let's say, I mean, can you stake out where the greenhouses are going to be? Or can you, can you do something like that? So people can get a sense of what you're proposing to construct? Sure. Yes. That's what that looks like, but something to, to give people an idea of if they, if they drive by, they'll see, well, okay, this is where these things are going to be located. Yes. So we spoke with the, um, with the lessor um, and asked if they would make time available for town leadership uh, to come by and um, walk the property. And they say, said that they would make time available um, relative to when the community outreach meeting would be. Um, so we can follow up with them uh, and get specific times for people to come. Um, Maybe there's a process we could run where we get uh, interested parties uh, names and then can allocate times for that um, for, for the purposes of social distancing. Yeah, I, I'm not sure how it would all work, but yeah, just kind of even standing at the road, you don't really get a good sense of. Right. You really need to walk up the driveway to, to see back and see how large the property is and, you know, how far set back the, um, the greenhouses would be. And what, what size, uh, what tier was this? I don't, I can't recall from. Yeah, it would be a tier 11. Um, so it would be the, the largest size. Um, and so our intention is to have uh, 45,000 square feet of greenhouse uh, and um, the remainder being outdoor cultivation. Okay, so I don't know if there's any way to, uh, I don't know how, how you could communicate that. to people Flag that, to yes. Like, yes. Yeah, that would be very beneficial. Great. John and I will have an offline conversation about how to do that. And so we can, we can try to prepare something uh, physical on the site that would allow people to see what the physical dimensions of what we're proposing would be. Um, but it would be significantly, I mean, just as a plug for our project, it would be set back, you know, per the um, setbacks in the town bylaws. Um, we're working with um, Berkshire Design Group, um, who's also working with Bernie, uh, just south of the line, um, and worked with, as we understand it, almost every other applicant in, uh, in Waitley. So they're, they're very much familiar with the, the town uh, bylaws um, as, uh, as we're getting uh, up to speed on them as well. Just, uh, I guess, uh design question you or setback question you have to be so far from the river as well uh that's a good question we're across the street from the river so that that oh. doesn't um that's oh. more a question for bernie than it is for us oh you're across okay now you're on this so you're on the west side of correct on, on the road. west side of river road correct oh, okay. yes correct sir yep and there's wetlands 
further west of your property. As that well. is exactly right. Yes, in all, it's about 51 acres. I believe that the owners bought 30 acres of that wetlands behind them. Um, there's about 21 acres uh, that are mostly dry. There are some wetlands on the property that we're aware of, um, and we're going to have the um, Berkshire Design Group come back and, and help us with that. But you're, you're leasing, you're not, you're not buying the property, right? We have a lease with an option to purchase and we intend to purchase within, um, you know, within the first few years of operation. Okay. So I think the, the, the question now for the board is whether it wants to um, give written permission for the remote community outreach meeting to take place. Thank you, sir. Yes. I, I'm, I'm, I'm supportive. Uh, I have no problem with it. Do we need a motion, Brian? Yeah. Yeah, we we'll actually need something in writing that the that we okay. can. Send so we can move and vote on it, and then one of us, or probably presumably me, comes in and signs it tomorrow or something. Uh, yeah, it just says the applicant shall obtain approval in writing from the contracting authority or, the, or authorized representative. So if you want to authorize Joyce to. Mm. Um, well, either way, if you want to authorize Joyce to sign it, that'd be fine, and we could get to send them off a letter. More work for Joyce, less work for me. I'm all for it. <laughs> yeah, that's fine with me. I am only chair for like two more meetings here. <laughs> um, and then the second uh, prong of our request here is that we be able to submit a draft host community agreement that will be substantively the same as uh, the NAP advisors. Uh, host community agreement um, for negotiation in the future with the select board. No, um, as, as far as I know, we, we don't necessarily give people permission to submit something. You can just submit it because this is a free country and you can freaking submit whatever you want. Um, but but that, that's usually the starting point of, Great. Uh, of that process is to, um, uh, to submit. Um, okay. You guys should be aware though that we have a host community agreement template that we um, yeah. are quite tied to okay. and fond of. Okay. Um, and, and it's mostly because we want to treat everyone with exceptional equity and fairness. Yes. Um, so personally, I would be hard pressed to believe that I will deviate from what we have already agreed to with other uh, Great. potential uh, companies in, in town. Great. So we've, we've received the NAP advisors uh, mm -hmm. uh, agreement, which, uh, and, and we just, we, we basically used that. Okay. Okay, and the numbers are pretty, pretty consistent? Uh, exactly the same. I mean, there's no change. Okay. All right. Uh, well, then uh, can we have a motion on that first one too? I'm sorry, Brian, could you say that again? Oh, you can email that to me. Great, you know, thank you very much. Great. The awesome. process in the past has been Joyce and I will work with the applicants and we'll make a recommendation to the board if that's what the board wants to do. Lovely. Thank you. Okay. Um, so maybe we should have a motion on uh, the, uh, we, sounds like we all support um, having a community outreach meeting with our, uh, in our distance learning fashion. Um, and uh, you're authorizing me to uh, sign the paperwork, uh, say tomorrow, I'm missing tomorrow at the town offices um and i'll just make that a motion i move that we um we give permission for the for the meeting as specified by the law and um authorize me to sign second uh, all those in favor john yes fred yes me yes okay um so i think that's probably it for uh, John and Jared. Uh, unless... Thank you guys very much. I appreciate your time. Thanks, you guys. All right. Thanks for coming by. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next on the agenda is the Waitley Energy Committee uh, to discuss recommendations for the town regarding the current municipal aggregation effort. Um, and that will set some default <coughs> electricity suppliers for residents and it's likely to provide additional options for residents who are seeking um, uh, a higher percentage of renewable in their electric, um, electric consumption. 
So uh, at the end of the discussion, what we're hoping to do is to authorize some individual to be the person who can sign on our behalf uh, next week when the real pricing comes out. So um, I should turn it over to someone on the Energy Committee. Um, Nat, Paul, John, who wants to take this? Pas moi. I nominate Nat. Yeah, I do too. All right. <laughs> okay, Nat, you're on the hot seat. Nat? Nat's frozen. He's frozen there. Sorry, I keep moving the connection. Oh, he keeps, all right, I'm gonna, uh, I'll let him take my chair. Oh! <laughs> yeah, from one screen to the other. Yeah. But he still exists on this one. We're asking more of Comcast than they can provide to have two screens connected to the same service. <laughs> I'm gonna go, I'll go get so a chair. So perhaps you could uh, rephrase the question or repeat the question. Well, Joyce asked the question. Nat, I think we're looking to, I, I, I think yeah. we're looking to have. Maybe a little a, summary of the aggregation. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Meeting today. So, um, uh, Brian also was attending the meeting and has a, a good summary of some of the, uh, the action points to be needed. Um, but let me just remind anyone who's on the call is not familiar is that a number of years ago, the town voted to allow, uh, the town representatives to seek the ability of aggregating electricity. That is, you know, of finding a source of electricity that would be provided to members of the town um, unless they chose to choose a different supplier. Uh, with the expectation and essentially the requirement that the electric, that by doing so we could uh, save on electricity costs. Uh, and in addition, with the aspiration of being able to use electricity from uh, cleaner sources in terms of using less carbon. Uh, and so that task got handed off to the Energy Committee, which I'm currently chairing. And we've been, we have worked with uh, 12 other towns, uh, primarily in Franklin County, to uh, issue an RFQ and an RFP for a electricity aggregator or an agent who would help us aggregate find uh, vendors that would be willing to provide electricity uh, to town residents. So, and that has uh, resulted in the selection of an aggregator called Colonial Power. But I wanna point out Colonial does not provide electricity, rather they go out and solicit bids based on town criteria uh, from electricity providers across the country uh, to see if they'll help us with this task, or facilitate the task. All right, so that's part of the history. Uh, it's probably also important to talk about how this differs from our local electric utility, uh, Western Mass Electric. Um, and Western, if you ever looked at your electricity bill, uh, recently you've seen that there are a number of different charges in different cents per kilowatt hour totaling up to your total bill. And one, many of those are associated with tasks that uh, Wimiko does for us directly. You know, maintenance of uh, power lines, repair of power lines, uh, all the things that are required to reliably transfer electricity uh, from a generator to our homes. Uh, in addition, uh, Western Mass Electric also buys and sell, resells electricity from electricity producers for residents of the town who don't want to go out and look for electricity elsewhere. Uh, this has uh, been the case since uh, electricity deregulation. And in the early years, it was primarily an option that was taken advantage of by uh, businesses where they might be able to contract for a different electrical rate or a favorable rate. Uh, and most residents uh, stayed with basic service. Um, it, there are some residents in the town who have taken it upon themselves to individually arrange for a different energy provider. Uh, and, uh, but for the most part, uh, the town has what's called 
the option of what happens if you do nothing, which is called the basic service option. Now that has to meet a certain criteria established by the state. Uh, right now it needs to be 28% uh, renewable energy, 16% of it has to be from what are called new energy sources uh, since 1998, and 12% uh, can be from older, and the older one is primarily, say, hydropower, and, and the primarily new one is often wind. Or wind. Um, but in the state criteria can also include uh, biomass as a renewable source. All right, so what is the Energy Committee doing and what is Colonial Power uh, provide, researching? What, it, what we're doing is looking into changing one line in that electricity bill, which is the cost per kilowatt hour of the electricity itself. Um, and our criteria going into it, which we voted on and specified in the RFP and the RFQ to Colonial, uh, and is that the electricity that we provide, if we were going to adopt this, should meet two criteria. The first is it should be cheaper than, known to be cheaper than what the basic service option is currently. And it should be uh, plausibly anticipated to be cheaper than what, um, has uh, traditionally been the case, or what you might anticipate the case for in the future. Of course, your basic service, or maybe not of course, but its price changes uh, twice a year if you have the standard basic service. There's a cheaper rate in summer and a more expensive rate in winter. Uh, the last three years, the average for Western Mass Electric for this part of your bill has been uh, 10 point5 cents um, and the the five year average has been 9 point9 cents because electricity has been slowly getting more expensive over time all right um, the and for this uh, last winter it was about 11 and a half cents I might have that slightly wrong uh, and the proposal for this coming half of the year, from uh, Wimiko is for nine cents, 9.02 cents per kilowatt hour. All right, so let me stop there and see if there are questions about the background before I talk about uh, the indicative pricing that uh, Colonial put for us today and actions that the town might or might not choose to take a week from now on this. Okay. Hearing, hearing none. All right. And I don't see anything in the chat window either. Um, okay. So the way it works is uh, the towns agreed to all go in together on the purchase so as to uh, get favorable pricing. Uh, and that's the plan here. What that means is when the aggregator solicits bids, they solicit bids from, say, five different electricity generators, and all 13 towns would choose one of those as their electricity provider. The service would uh, still um, come through Amico. Uh, it's just that that part of the bill uh, would, would go to uh, a different source. All right, and what else do we need to talk about? Okay, so they gave us indicative pricing and they gave us some estimated pricing from if we'd gone into the market two months ago. Uh, and we now will need to make a decision about whether we want to go forward with electricity aggregation from a common vendor in conjunction with these 12 other towns uh, a week from now. That would be the date where we would get the final pricing and then need to be able to agree to do this or not because the pricing changes every day. Hey, Nat. Yes. Isn't it fair to say that in addition to the decision as to whether to go with the chosen vendor, we would also need to decide what mix and at what cost? That, that's that correct. Mix? That's right. 
Um, you must have seen the cue card I had over here and I was holding up to you. Okay. So um, now before I get into that, I should point out that any resident who is currently contracted with a different electricity generator, they would stick with that generator through the length of their contract, right? This would, and anybody who wanted to continue getting the basic service through Western Mass Electric could also opt to do that, but they would have to actively say that's what they want to do. Okay. Um, so now what we're talking about are, we're going to move to what options we could provide to the town residents other than the Western Mass Electric option. And here, the requirements that we set forward in at the State Department of Energy Resources uh, uh, stipulated are that there should be something called a default option and then additional opt-in option. So what are we talking about here? Uh, the default option is the idea that if you do nothing, you should still have guaranteed continuous electricity. So we don't want to do anything where failure to respond would mean your electricity was cut off. So the state requires there be a default option. And default option is just what you'll get unless you choose something else. All right. In addition, um, our request and the state uh, concurred that there should be at least one other option available to town residents from the same supplier. So some of the suppliers were, uh, uh, were named, um, but if the one that is, there was one that this time around was cheapest for essentially everything. And so the idea would be, you would pick one of their offerings as your default option and another of their offerings or two of their other offerings as ones that options that someone could select that they could opt into. Again, I want to emphasize that people can always opt out of this entirely. Opting out would mean that they stick with the basic service option provided by Western Mass Electric or with what other provider they still have, they have now. And I believe that every resident in Waitley, if we to vote to go forward, Every resident in Waitley will get a postcard in the mail giving them that opt out. Well, that's option. right. That's right. Um, you, you need, of course, you want people to have as informed a decision as possible. And our responsibility, as we've interpreted, it, has been to make sure that even if someone does not respond to that postcard or any of the other methods of outreach, that the electricity that they would get would be cheaper and greener in the sense of lower carbon emissions than what they currently get through the basic service option. They currently get through what Wemico buys and sells, right? We thought otherwise, to do otherwise would be irresponsible. There wouldn't be a good reason to switch or to go through this exercise. All right, there might be people who want options that even though they're more expensive, are still greener still. Um, and so those might be things that we offer. Okay, so now this is, to go further, I sort of need to make, uh, express what my individual recommendation would be. Um, and since this is a joint meeting of the Energy Committee and, and, the, and the Select Board, uh, I, I think then this would be the opportunity to have some deliberation about this. But we need to settle on some criteria by which we would choose a default option, any other opt-in options, or decide not to participate, right? Because a week from now, there'll be final pricing for different options, and they will require a signature from the town and a specification of what our default and other options are. And so because the cheapest supplier might be a different one next week from this, 
or that the pricing may change in some way. What I'm recommending is that we settle on criteria that would be easily understood by whoever the person is who's designated to decide to sign the contract uh, and, and, and to do so. Let me pause for any other questions there on the chat or otherwise. What, what is the criteria you're talking about? Okay. And is is that, that well, shown well, or are you gonna get into these uh, comparison charts? What, what's all this mean? Yes, so Fred, um, what I'm about to do is make a recommendation for what I think the criteria are, the specific criteria, as opposed to the overarching, and then you and other select board members with input from the Energy Committee are going to decide on what the criteria are. But what the criteria will be is your decision. It has to be the decision of the select board. So to remind you, the overall criteria are whatever we recommend for a default option needs to be cheaper now than what would be the offering from Western Mass Electric and for the longer term uh, should be anticipated to be cheaper than at least what it's been for the same uh, duration in the past. So there is a six month offering from Western Mass Electric for 9.02 cents per kilowatt hour for now through the end of December. Um, and so our default option from, that, from when we start through the end of December, which would probably be August, uh, better be cheaper than 9.02 cents per kilowatt hour, right? Or we don't go forward at all. Uh, the second criteria is that whatever we offer should not only be cheaper, it should um, be cleaner in terms of carbon emissions. Right? It should do better than the mass renewable portfolio standard, which the Western Mass Electric basic default service adheres to. All right, now what about specifics? Uh, there are, there's more than one choice that is cheaper than what Western Mass Electric is proposing for the coming half of the year. Um, there are also options then from January of next year through whatever duration we want, which are cheaper than um, what Western Mass Electric has been in the past. And so uh, what the towns decided based on what they looked at in indicative pricing now is that they wanted to pursue a contract up through the end of the year and then a separate contract starting in January of next year that would last for 36 months, that would last for three years. The reason they're recommending this is because those prices are flat for the next three years. Now, if you buy the electricity now, but the anticipation would be if you were to buy electricity for a year and then go back in the market, the price would be higher. So that uh, typically the price is, is, is higher over a longer contract just because people expect electricity prices to go up. In this unusual economic circumstance, uh, we have an opportunity to contract for three years electricity at essentially the same price as if we did it for one. All right, so the general thinking of the towns now, subject to your approval, is that we have a contract at a certain price for now, from the beginning of the service through the end of the year, and then a second price for a, and that would be a five month period, and then a second price for a 36 year, 36 month contract with another three years. Okay? <clears throat> now, so let's talk about prices. Um, the, the service that is both cheaper than Western Mass Electric's 9.02 cents for the uh, remainder of this year and greener in the sense that there's a lower percentage of electricity from 
uh, carbon sources is something that's called a uh, 100% national wind. What that means is that it's wind source or renewable energy credits from wind that anywhere in the country. So for example, some of it might be Massachusetts, some of it might be Texas. Um, but it is a 100% green product and its price would be cheaper than the Western Mass Electric offering. Not by much, it would be 8.95 cents instead of 9.02, but it would be cheaper and be 100% green instead of 28%. All right, so um, <clears throat> that's the first recommendation is that the default option for the town to choose would be the service that is uh, greener and cheaper than Western Mass Electric for the next, for the remainder of the year. And that would be the national wind. You could choose other ones from the portfolio that are still also cheaper or the same price, but this is the one that best meets the criteria. All right, your choice for default options starting in January are, are a myriad, um, but my personal recommendation, the one that the rest of the energy committee needs to weigh in and that you need to make a decision on, mm -hmm. my personal recommendation would be to stick with that 100% national wind as our default option. That is, that's what everyone would get unless they choose something else. Um, and that one, the indicative pricing, the pricing if we signed a contract, had signed a contract today, was uh, 9.4 cents. Now, let me remind you that in the, the, when you get your basic service from like Western Mass Electric, the summer is always cheaper than the winter uh, last summer, it was 9.8 cents. This winter, it was like 11.5. And now this coming summer, it's nine. Um, the five-year average is 9.9 .9 cents. And the three-year average, which is probably the better comparison since we're proposing to do a three-year contract, is 10.5 cents. So this would be a cent cheaper for three years than the last three years have been on average from Western Mass Electric. Of course, things could change, but we're, we have the opportunity to lock in a price that is significantly lower than either the five or the three year average if we choose to go with a three year contract. All right. And I'm gonna jump in again for yes. a quick second just so that everyone understands that national wind typically will not be Massachusetts wind. It will be Texas or wind from the plains. So we will not be displacing any traditional fossil fuel mix from our sourced energy. Well, we're getting into the weeds a little bit. Yeah, but this. Um, but the commitment from basic service is that 28% of your energy will come from what Massachusetts calls renewable sources. And that's solar and that's wind and that's hydro. And it's also curiously biomass, yep. uh, which doesn't make much sense to me, but that's a very, that's a small part of it. Uh, and the other 72% comes from coal and nuclear and, uh, and uh, natural gas, gas, natural gas and the like. So some of it might be carbon free, some of it won't be, but it's other conventional sources of energy. Right. Uh, this is coming from wind energy or equivalently in all these cases, a utility can buy renewable energy credits from a wind producer. All right, so it's not producing new um, renewable energy sources because it's not class one, which means new as in the sense of within the last 12 years, 
um, but it is from renewable sources. Right. No, and I guess my only point in that is that, and I'm not saying I, I, I don't, I, that I disagree with your recommendation. I'm just saying that this, this option doesn't remove our dependency upon. Correct. So, so here's the deal. That's because my, that's the first of my two recommendations, right? The first thing we have to decide is what's our criteria for the default service. And so you are raising issues of things that the default service does not do, right? In a, um, that other options do in addition to what the default service does. All right, but the default service is cheaper, can be expected to be cheaper, and is greener than the default, than the basic service option. So it meets those minimum criteria that we think the residents would require to be to find this option and to find this switch and provider acceptable. Now, because it does not require the production of new electrical sources that are clean that are cleaner, um, there are several other options that the towns asked for, including us. Uh, and that the Colonial Power went out to their vendors for bids. These are what I'm suggesting would be the opt-in options that we would offer in addition to the default option. Now, there should be at least one opt-in option. That is one something, and all of these opt-in options have the additional feature that you were about starting to allude to, Jonathan. That is that they offer more Massachusetts-based new renewable energy than is offered in the Western Mass Electric Basic Service. So this is something they call it the Renewable Portfolio Standard. And again, that means 16% from new sources, 12 from old, for a total of 28%. The other options are described in terms of what additional percentage should come from class one sources. So for example, there's an option to do 5% additional class one. Class one means new and it means, um, yeah, and, it, and, and in this case, it means Massachusetts. And so that would mean that over and beyond what you're getting from the basic service option now through Omico, instead of there being at least 12% that's for new renewable sources or newer sources, right? Anything since 98, you would have 17%. And so that should stimulate ideally the growth of the renewable, the new renewable market, new solar, new wind, new hydro, by 5% for at least the sense of the portion of the market that we are responsible for. There's also, uh, we went and asked for bids on 25% additional, 50% additional, and 100%. So the 100% option is not, is 100% green, but it's has the benefit of over the default option, over the national win option, that this would be money that's going to go directly into the Massachusetts economy in, in, in the construction or paying for newer renewable energy sources. There is a cost to that, however, um, because it's more expensive to build in Massachusetts these sources than uh, in other parts of the country. Um, and so if, for example, of the far extreme, 100% Massachusetts class one renewable would be 13 cents a kilowatt hour, right? That would be four cents more than the basic service. It could be that there are some residents in this town that would like that option, right? And so that could be one of the ones that you put on the table for them to be able to choose. 
but you should you should not anticipate that a large number of people would choose into that. Um, you shouldn't anticipate that a large number of people will do anything other than take the default option, which requires doing nothing at all. Um, I would recommend, however, that in addition to that most extreme option, most local, most clean, that we have one other option that builds on, that has more new Massachusetts renewable, more class one recs as they're called, than Wamiko, but is still cheaper than the three year average for basic service from Wamiko, right? So when you look at that, the three year average is 10.5 cents. And you could go to um, an additional 25% above the Massachusetts Renewable Portfolio <laughs> Standard. So instead of 15, instead of 16%, you would have 41% uh, from Massachusetts new renewable sources. You could do that at a price that would be less than the three-year average from ECO if prices are as they are today. So that's a long explanation, but probably necessarily so, to say that we can provide our residents with something that is cheaper and greener by default. Um, and we can provide our residents options that are in a greener than default, greener than the, the basic service option, greener than what they're getting now, and are, are stronger in terms of their investment in Massachusetts, but again, cheaper than the uh, three year average price uh, for electricity has been. Um, and so that would be one of the opt-in options I'd recommend. And it could be that the exact percentage above the renewable percent varies. Maybe it's going to be 10%, maybe it's going to be 15, maybe it's going to be 25, maybe it's going to be 50, right? But what I'm recommending as a criteria is that we have a default option, which is a national wind, 100%. And an opt-in, which is as much more in terms of Massachusetts class one renewable energy credits as possible above the Massachusetts standard, above the basic service, but still be cheaper than the last three year average for that default for that basic service. My third recommendation is that in addition, there be a second opt in option, which would either be 50% or 100% uh, mass renewables. The pricing indicative for that is something like 11 and a half cents and 13 cents. The rest of the board, the select board would need to sort of weigh in on uh, choosing from, from those. That means that the resident would have a default option that's cheaper and greener. Two other options that in addition are stimulating the growth of new renewable sources and reducing the dependence on, on carbon uh, for that new demand. And uh, an addition would have the option of sticking with what they have if they're at all uncertain or, or for any other reason want to keep what they have now. All right, that's the end of my uh, uh, proposals and comments. I don't know if there was something that Brian wanted to add uh, from his summary of the meeting itself. Um, not necessarily in terms of, in terms of process, just to, to bring it back to that for a second. Um, there'll be, the town will receive executable pricing on May 20th. So that's a week from today. And at that point, that's when the town would need to make a decision. Um, we had thoughts about um, another joint meeting with the select board and energy committee to review that. I don't know if that's that's something that the, the board should also talk about, whether we actually want to meet and talk about um, what we actually receive.
but uh, I think that summary was was uh, very well done. All right, and, and the reason I would ask us to agree on criteria now is that we only have a couple of hours right. from when we receive the pricing to where you uh, have to fish or cut bait, where yep. you have to sign or not. And it's so uh, a full deliberation, uh, it's unlikely to uh, be able to reach a conclusion in time if we don't already have our criteria in mind. Um, can I ask one other quick question? I, just for clarity, you know, several years ago, we worked very hard to maximize the installation of solar on people's homes in town. And I want to make sure that people understand that this doesn't really impact whether you have solar or not on your home. Um, yeah. It will impact the bankable dollars that you may be banking because if you choose one of the more expensive kilowatt hour options as one of your opt-ins, the, that the money that's banked may disappear more rapidly, but it right. does not impact the fact that you have solar at all. Right. And, and Colonial Power's experience is that typically 95 to 98% of the residents take the default option. So you're talking about somewhere between two and 5% who might want something that's even greener than the default option in the sense that it would be for new construction in Massachusetts of renewable energy, right? So it has that added benefit at an added cost. And that's right. But two of those three options that I'm proposing are ones that we would anticipate that would still be cheaper than the average pricing for the same duration from, uh, from Western Mass Electric's basic service. Only the third option, the 100% new Massachusetts renewable would be more expensive and would fit the category that you're talking about. So only those who would choose the 13 cent a kilowatt hour option would have that concern and perhaps their priorities would be otherwise. Okay, so these prices you gave on this printout, Brian sent, this is what, just a, an estimate? But what, is, what does this represent? It's, it represents the prices we would receive if we signed a contract today. Okay, and so are you expecting these to what, go down next by next week? By next week, uh, we're expecting them to be largely unchanged because the projected pricing for the next three years is unchanged. Um, they are cheaper than they were two months ago, and they're certainly cheaper than they were half a year ago. Um, but there's a reason that it's cheaper than two months ago. Uh, and that reason is why the prices are unlikely to change still further. That is, you know, the price of energy has dropped because the demand has dropped, but um, the prices are unlikely to go down much further in the opinion of Colonial Power, primarily because if the prices were to drop further, fewer, more and more suppliers would simply drop out of the market and stop providing like energy at all. So uh, the, this is a, a fortuitously a very good time to be able to make long range purchases. But we have no guarantee that the price won't fluctuate you know, a fraction, a hundredth of a cent or even a tenth of a cent between now and next week. However, if we have agreed that the criteria should be, the default will be cheaper and greener, um, and, and that the uh, opt-ins will be one that is not as cheap as the cheapest one we offer, but still cheaper than uh, what the three-year average has been for Western Mass Electric, and that there be one that maxes out the green power, then I think we can keep those criteria even when prices change. 
And if there were, that is, I would say if suddenly something happened between now and next week so that we could not offer a default that was cheaper and greener and an opt-in that was still cheaper, although not as cheap, then and, and even more greener, I would say don't go, don't go forward, right? We always have that option to do nothing. But if our criteria is we ought to have those two options available for the town, then even if the price changes 0.02 cents or something, uh, we could still go forward. We could look at what those, what best satisfies those criteria. I mentioned this week's because I wanted to be specific about examples there. And this week, at this day, the default option that you would choose under those criteria is 100% national win, both for the remaining five months of the year, because we wouldn't be able to start till August, uh, and the three years following that. And the recommendation that's just my, again, personal recommendation, you guys can choose to do differently, is that um, one of those opt-ins be one that adds more class one Massachusetts renewables than is required under the standard renewal portfolio, more than is provided under the basic service, but still cheaper than that 10.4 cent average, three year average that we've had from Western Mass Electric. And a third option that allows uh, those few members, uh, residents who might want to do so, to, to go all in on renewable uh, Massachusetts, new renewable electricity from Massachusetts. I have a couple of comments if I could. <clears throat> um, one is that the uh, one convenient handle is um, that every penny above whatever the low price is, is about a $6 monthly increase to your bill, assuming 600 kilowatt hours per month as an average. Um, I also want to say that, Nat, I think you did a spectacular job at explaining this. And, <clears throat> and I'm inclined to agree with you on your, on your recommendation of both the national wind and the 41% and the third option of the 100%. That seems like a good, good idea to me. And also, I just want to be clear, if if a resident doesn't want anything to do with this, they can still stick with Wamiko, correct? Right, but the terms of the terms set by the state are: if a resident does nothing, they will right. switch, on, and they currently have Wamiko's basic service option. That will switch to our new default. Correct. They don't have to switch, but they would have to check a box on the postcard that says, I don't want to switch. I want to pay the higher price and have not as clean energy. <laughs> right. right. But they well, would, I mean, but you know, you may have a comfort with this supplier that you've had in the past that you just don't want to change. I just right. wanted to make sure that it was yeah. clear that they did have the option. That's right, to but they do have to do something to not change. Right. That's the way the law is set yeah. uh, for these electricity aggregations. And that's also why companies are willing to make a bid, because otherwise they would anticipate that only 5% would bother to do something. Yep. Um, and so that's why we're able to get the low prices that we're able to get uh, being offered. So the, the options that we pick, is it gonna matter to, there's what, 12 other communities? And oh, so. Is it gonna matter what the no. total picks as options and is that gonna affect or could affect the price? No, um, as long as we all agree on the same supplier, each town can choose from the options presented by that supplier, each town can choose their own default option, 
and their own opt-in options, right? Okay. So um, uh, another town, say Gill, might say, uh, I want our default option to be 5% additional Massachusetts class one recs instead of what our, my recommendation for a default option was. But it won't matter as long as we're getting it from the same supplier, right? So essentially there might be five options and we all have to, the restriction will be that we need to pick from the five options from this one particular supplier, right? One town can't choose to have energy from supplier C and the other one from supplier D. So right now, however, that's not much of a restriction because in almost every case, the same supplier had the lowest bids. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, Nat, you did a great job um, explaining it. You should probably it. get a job teaching. E exactly. Um, the, you know, I, there's a part of me that likes the, the 50% option instead of the 100% option above mm -hmm. RPS. And I say that only because I wonder whether you would get more people choosing that option over the 100% because I wonder how many people will choose two cents on, on roughly above the, 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 the norm. Sure. And, there and, are. You know, yes. It, it's just, it, it's just a demand issue. Right. Um, yeah, you know, I, and 50% and has a nice ring to it. Right. Um, I, I just am hard pressed to believe that a lot of people are going to grab that 100% option. So maybe we'd get more people at 50 if, if we just didn't offer the 100 at all. I certainly agree that's a, a legitimate uh, concern or issue. I mean, the, and another thing in, in favor of that is when you look at the pricing from 0% above basic service to 50% above, the price is scaling linearly with the added percentage. That is the cost added by going from adding 20%, 5% more, 50% more is twice what it is if you do 25% more, right? So if you go from nine cents you, to nine and a half to 10 or something, well, except in this case, it's more like nine cents to 10 to 11. To get to 100, you, the curve starts shooting up, Jump. right? You're, you're, you're paying more per percentage increase than you would if you went to 50%. Right. And the 50% option, again, is although not cheaper than the, um, not cheaper than the three-year average, it's cheaper than the typical winter average, right? So it's still within a region of pricing that we have found acceptable enough to not do something about in the past, you know. Right. Um, but uh, it, it, you have to weigh that against the ability to someone to do as much as they possibly can for the environment in terms of their electricity consumption. They would, I suppose they would still have the option of opting out, trying to find something like that on their own. Uh, but what we're trying to do is make it easier for the bulk of the town to save money and be uh, produce less carbon. Right. And, and I just and I just wonder whether the fifty percent option. Yeah. Is so that I should a, stop a, a talking and ask uh, like Paul to weigh in and the select board to weigh in. Yeah. Well, I I I agree with your uh, initial recommendation, Matt. So I I would go along with that. So maybe, uh, uh, Jonathan, you've been, I don't know which hat you've been wearing up to now, but maybe uh, assuming you've also been weighing in as a select board member, uh, perhaps Joyce or Fred would like to weigh in at this point. You know, I think that the 50% the 50 option is going to cost you more for the first uh, year. And yeah, under, uh, under any plausible circumstance, those people choosing the an opt-in of either 50 or 
would be choosing to pay more for their electricity on average than they are now. Right. Someone choosing a 25% option right now would not be choosing to pay more on average. Right. It's absolutely true that that particular option, whether it's the 50% or the 100%, uh, Massachusetts class one, would be an option only for those who wanted, who are willing and able to pay more. Um, but I'm wondering what you're thinking about the other two options where they would pay less. One pay less than the three year average and one pay even less, even more or less than that. Well, I, I, I would find it hard for me to say, for me personally, to go with the 50%. I, I just, because you're paying more for the first year. That's, I understand, Fred. Um, you would be choosing either the default option or let's say the 25% option, because both of those are cheaper. Right. What we're discussing now, in addition to that default option and that 25% opt-in option, should there be an additional opt-in option? Well, and should that additional opt-in option be something that offers 50% or 100? Recognizing that they would both be more expensive, but one would still, one would be even more expensive than the other. Recognizing that anybody who chose that second opt-in option, rather than default or the first option, was doing so because they wanted to go still further in terms of reducing their carbon footprint rather than because they wanted to lower energy. And so we're wondering for those people in the town that want to go further, does it make more sense to offer them one that's 50% that would reduce the carbon emissions in half uh, or would they be unsatisfied with that and want to go still further with the 100%? I guess that's not my choice. If I, if you're asking me what I would pick, uh, okay, the standard the standard one, okay, that's fine. The default, the uh, hundred percent green with the wind. Uh, I guess I think that's that's a reasonable one. And then I would go with either the the twenty five percent or or the fifty percent uh, green renewable. Okay, I, I don't think the hundred percent is understood. Good. Yeah, that much interest. So yeah, ultimately, that's, that's what I would recommend today if you're asking me what we should. Well, we are asking you because you, Jonathan, and Joyce yeah. need to set the criteria um, and, and to make a recommendation for what the default is and what the other options are. Okay. And so I'm proposing a default plus two options. Um, <clears throat> and we're looking for guidance from you as to whether you're happy with that default in the first option. And it sounds like you are. Yes. Personally. And some guidance on what the person signing the contract should choose as far as the second opt-in option, the one that's more expensive, but greener and smaller footprint. Uh, because it's unlikely that we can really deliberate further other than to say, here's the actual pricing and it's, it's still the case that we could go forward or here's the pricing and there's no point in doing this because they've changed too much. Is, are you asking for two options here or three? Um, I am proposing a default, right. which is what happens if people do nothing. Right, okay. Plus two opt-ins. Opt-ins, so, okay. So there are three options, but the language they use is that one of them is called the default and the other two are called opt-ins. Okay. They're called opt-ins because you would have to check a box saying, I want this instead. Okay. Now, the, the, I think it's confusing language because there's also an opt-out and the opt out is saying, I want Western Mastic, Ma Massachusetts Basic Electric instead. All right. So if what I'm recommending were to be adopted by the select board here, they would have 
four alternatives, one of which they would get if they do nothing, right. two of which would be new options for them, and the fourth of which would be what they're getting now. Right, okay. Okay, I, I have no problem with, with the default one here is, is the standard one you have and then the, the wind one for the it's 100% green supposedly. I guess I'd suggest that is, is one opt-in and the other option opt-in would be the, the 50% renewable. I think I got those backwards. The 100% national wind is cheaper. Right. That's the cheapest one, so that would be the default. And that's the default, right? That would be default? That would be default. But, oh, that, okay. mean, that, but that wind is not coming from Massachusetts. That's why it's so much cheaper. Yeah. Oh, okay, well. Help feed new growth in renewables. And there are lots of people, and I'd say myself included, who are interested in having more renewables in our local grid. So the other two opt-in options would put some money towards that. You're paying a little bit more than the cheapest one. But I, I think because of what we promised people, it should be that the cheapest one is the one that's the default. That's really right. our imperative to do that. Yeah, and but I, I just want to make that. sure that you, you understood that that was the case. It says 100% renewables, and that's certainly uh, one way to look at it, but there's multiple ways of looking at it. And because that uh, renewable energy is coming from out of state, to some people that's less desirable, but some people don't care. It's like, great, 100% renewables, I'm there. And I think that, you know, we, we these options um, let us have that, you know, with people with different ways of looking at it can all find something that they like and can afford. <clears throat> So Fred, I think that the, the choice that Nat's giving you, assuming that it sounds like you like the 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 twenty five percent increase, and you're and you're good with the, with our definition of default, do you want to go with the fifty or the one hundred option for the second opt in? Is that right, Nat? Yeah, I would I would say the fifty percent. Right, and and to me, the looking at this, I'm trying to, I mean, we're trying to make a decision for a great number of people, and um, like just the, the thinking, well, if I wouldn't want that, is that how I should recommend moving forward? I mean, I I don't know which I would pick if I were offered both the fifty percent and the hundred percent, um, but I can see good arguments for both. So I'm sort of kind of torn between um, Nat's original proposal of a hundred percent and John suggesting the 50 percent and then Nat actually giving some reasons why that might be a, a reasonable thing to do as well so I'm kind of torn there um, but it sounds like both John and Fred are leaning towards the 50 percent so that might be the way to go well Joyce I'll clarify Nat asked me the hats that I'm wearing and that's a fair question um, oh, put on the other hat and give us another answer because well, I want to be consistent with, with 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 how I approach all the decisions we make here and that's just I sound like I'm on a bully pulpit, and maybe I am. But from an energy perspective, committee perspective, I would go with the 50%. However, as someone who really tries to heed the advice of the committees that we ask to be experts in a certain area, as long as I can stomach that, that decision, which I can't always, but usually I can, you know, as an energy committee member, I would say go for the 50%. But once the energy committee endorses a, a slate, if you will, then I'm probably going to, as a select board member, I'm probably going to vote for whatever the energy committee recommends. Well, sadly, the energy committee didn't actually get to meet and make a full recommendation. Well, we're meeting now, though. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so maybe... Yeah. Step back and let the energy committee meet yeah. here. So I guess the only other thing I would add that we haven't said before about the 50% is that would still be um, a 50% reduction in carbon emissions. 
Um, and we need to get to at least that level if we want atmospheric levels to stop climbing. <clears throat> All right, because we're filling the atmosphere with carbon twice as fast as Earth can sequester it. That's why the amount of carbon in the atmosphere rises every year, because we're the 11 gigatons a year of carbon that we put in from fossil fuel burning and deforestation, 10 of it from fossil fuels, is double the five to six that the earth can successfully remove each year. And so every year you have more in the atmosphere. Our very first step has to be to reduce emissions enough that the level, that the rate at which we're adding it no longer exceeds the rate at which the earth is removing, right? Otherwise the level keeps getting higher and higher and higher. The 50% option would take you to the point where you are no longer um, putting in carbon to the atmosphere faster than the earth can remove it. It would not reduce the level, which is another goal. But the very first one is to stabilize, and the 50% does that. What the 100% does for you in addition is give you a chance, at least through the electricity that you're using, to lower that level back to something that's safer than what we have today. Right. And it also compensates for the people who choose not to do anything. That's right. But until we get to at least a 50% reduction, we can never level off and we can never stop warming. Well, I've, I've made my vote. Oh, well, the, so the, does the Energy Committee want to make an official recommendation on that 50 versus 100? Well, I think we should probably vote, you know, and I think that's going to be, you know, I, I think, and I'm fine, you guys. I, I'm just, my, I mean, obviously, I'm a big proponent of climate change or, you know, mitigation. Stopping it. Right. Yes, thank you. Um, that being said, I also believe in market forces, and and I, I'm approaching it simply because I think more people. I, I don't think there are many people, and I didn't haven't done any market research, so you know it's a crystal ball that I don't have. I think that more people will opt for fifty percent than they will. I don't than hundred percent. I don't think a lot of people are going to choose the hundred percent. I want to maximize the number of people who choose and opt in. That's my perspective. So I would vote for the 50% as the second opt-in, but I am more than comfortable with the 100% because I, I get both scenarios easily. I'm for so however Paul and Nat want to go, I, I'm fine. I'm with the 100%. Um. I started with 100%. I understand 50. If the select board wants to choose 50 instead, I won't lose a lot of sleep over it. Uh, but I do worry that if we just do the 50% um, on, on the Massachusetts, option, some people will want to just do the default option because that one is 100% old sources. And I think, you know, I think. Um, that adding new sources is necessary to bring uh, carbon emissions down. Yeah, you know, so I, I'd like us, I would not want to inadvertently discourage someone from doing, uh, doing that. I think we're talking probably a handful of people right. at most. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe if they're not deciding on price, they won't care if, about the price difference between the 50% and the 100. Um, and the 25%, people who choose that will already be doing something. Mm -hmm. That's over and above the default. And the people doing the default will already be doing something of over and above what we're doing now. And, and so I think that's a good outcome in terms of uh, finances and the environment. So I guess I would stick with the 100, but really if someone doesn't see what they want, they can always go do something else entirely on their own. It's just that it's really hard to do and, and we wanted to have a reliable 
verifiable state approved uh, provider and not, you know, as opposed to these fly by night operations that, you know, show up in your mailbox sometimes. Okay, then uh, what I'm hearing from the Energy Committee is that their official recommendation is that the second opt in option be the 100% uh, new renewables. Um, so if we move now from uh, Energy Committee to Select Board, um, what would the uh, Select Board uh, like to decide? I believe we're in agreement already on what the criteria should be for the default and for the first opt in. Um, shall we uh, take a vote on the third option, that is the second opt-in? Yes, since, and, and, and Joyce, I'm happy to make a motion since I painfully lost the previous vote. Um, <laughs> oh, but, okay. but I am going to go, you know, with, with, with the suggestion of, of the Energy Committee because that's just the way we should, I, mm -hmm. I, I want to do it. Um, I'll make a motion for the default to be, as Nat suggested, the 100% national wind. The first opt-in would be the 25% above the Massachusetts RPS. And the second opt-in would be, for the recommendation of the Energy Committee, a 100% um, locally founded clean energy product uh, as, as suggested by, by Nat on, on the table that we have in front of us. Can I, can I make a friendly amendment? Sure. The, the one you specified is 25%. What I'd like to say is as large a percentage as is possible while remaining below the three year average uh, for the last three years from Western Mass Electric Basic Service which if we were to do today would be 25%. But it could be that it's going to be 30 or 50% next week, right? You know, I don't think so. Um, mm -hmm. But in order to, or it might be that we only can get 20% and still fit that criteria. Uh, I would like I was trying to make sure that two of the criteria, two of the options would be cheaper than the average price has been for basic service. And that, that is what again? So that is, um, I lost my sheet here now. Um, the three year average has been 10.5 cents. Okay, thanks. And so the reason that would translate to 25% now is that there's calling that 10.4 cents, right? So you're saying it's a game time decision next week. Yeah, that's right. And so I would like the criteria to be as high an additional percentage above the renewable, as high an additional percentage of class one Massachusetts recs as is possible above basic service while remaining below the three-year average price for average service of 10.5 cents. Sounds good. Okay, I'm fine with that, that parliamentary, uh, through parliamentary procedures. Do I, my amendment, do I remove my amendment or my, do I remove my, my, uh, uh, whatever I did? <laughs> it's friendly you accept it. I'll just withdraw what I said. And, and so my new motion would be the default of 100% wind. The first opt-in would be whatever option was available next week when we get the final options. The highest renewable percentage that does not put us over the current three-year average of what we pay through Omico. And then the third opt-in would be 100% locally produced clean energy. I'll second that. Okay. So you would, you would, you would know 
the prices of all these options before you have to tell them what options you're picking. That's right. Um, I think don't go any other way first to tell them and then. No, 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 no. We we didn't yeah. want to go into this blind at all. Um, and so two o'clock on the twentieth, we get the new pricing, or no later than two o'clock on the twentieth. And yeah. then I think by 3.30, Brian would know the exact time or we'll, uh, we have to say, yes, we'll accept it. And here's what the options we want or no, we don't accept it. And if I were your designee or if Brian is, I would say whoever the designee is should be given the option to walk away, right? If, if, if the options that are available don't meet the criteria we've set today. Yep. Okay, and if our, our third option is not acceptable, depending what we decide oh. today, is our third option, do we need something else to, or we just go with the no, two? That one, that one is not dependent on pricing, and so there would be no reason for that recommendation to change. Oh, okay. Because that's a for that's completely voluntary opt in. You have to you have to overtly check a box to 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 get that. So you really need to make a conscious decision. So our consciences consciences should be clean on that one. Okay, could you no pun intended? Could you repeat the motion again? <laughs> I don't know if that's possible. I don't know. All right, I make a motion. Amy, what did I say? No. Um, I make a motion that the default option for new source for Whitley residents be the 100% national win, which is dramatically cheaper than what we are currently paying with our Wamiko rates, excuse me, our Eversource rates. All right. The second, the, the, the second option, which is the first opt in would be for people to be able to choose a rate that is 25%. Go ahead, Joyce. Uh, as high a percentage. Oh, of sorry, yes. Renewables. Yeah, as the, as, as, as the price point will allow, not going over what we currently pay for a three year average. Thank you. Or have paid, yes. Yes, have paid, right. The third option is 100% for opt-in. You have to check a box, um, so you can't be duped. Um, the third option would be the, uh, and the second opt-in would be 100% um, locally produced clean energy. New locally produced. New yeah. locally produced clean According energy. According to the definition of the state, class right. one. Master's class one. And you can bicker over what class one is good or bad, but that's the way it goes. Okay. And that's also been seconded. Right. So is, is this going to be based on, on what percent, on what price, the, the first year or the third year? So, so Fred, our proposal, uh, the, the one that the towns wanted to take, put forward to all the select boards was to do the pricing in two stages. Uh, there'd be a pricing for whenever it starts, which would be anticipated to be August 1st through the end of this year, through the December 31st, all right? And that's, so for example, I think that's like 8.95 for the case that uh, you're recommending as default. Um, and then the second duration in contract is from January 1st, 2021, continuing for three years. So through December 31st, 2023. Right. So it's a five month contract plus a 36 month contract for a total of 41 months, but there's one price for the first five months. And then there's a different price for the next um, 36 months. 36 months. <coughs> uh, and that is because well, that's for a number of reasons, but uh, it isn't practical to do just three years starting from August. Uh, and so the best pricing strategy turned out to be to break it into two parts. 
Okay, so when you're when you're looking at the prices next week for the 10.5 average, uh, are you looking at the one year or, or the I guess the oh we're the looking at or the, or the three year? We're looking at the reason I'm suggesting looking at the three year historical average is that I'm also recommending a three year contract. Okay, so you'd be looking at the three-year prices. At uh, 36 months. 36 months, okay. Uh, and that was strongly recommended to the towns because of the unanticipated fa fact that the indicative pricing is the same for three years as for one. But historically, over a three-year period, there's not been a situation where the prices didn't rise. So, um, it could be that it doesn't make any difference whether they pick one year or three, but it's unlikely to be a benefit to only pick one. Okay, okay. I'm ready for the vote, I guess, if you are. Okay, um, all right, um, all those in favor, John? Yes. Fred? Yes. Joyce? Yes. Okay. Um, I think um, on Brian's list of uh, things to do here is we need to decide who will uh, take care, of, who will do the actual signing. Um, and uh, I guess I would be fine with uh, Brian doing the signing, but I would be happy to be available uh, for the pricing when it comes out on the 20th and uh, whatever support Brian thinks he would like um, on uh, applying those criteria, I would be happy to help. So you're suggesting Brian sign and you'll be there to help? I think he'll, he'll, he'll have the forms. <laughs> okay. um, and I don't know that they've worked out uh, every exact detail, but they're sending forms to our town administrator and whoever has to sign in is going to have to do something uh, to get that form from Brian and sign it, somehow, get it delivered because we're obviously not meeting in one place to sign forms together as has been done in the past. So would you, would you accept that nomination, Brian? Yeah, that would be fine. I would, I would value um, everybody's input, of course, on the 20th. Okay. Well, and we have a joint, we have a joint select board and energy committee meeting next to next uh, at two o'clock on the 20th, don't we? To monitor all this or no? Well, that's yeah. something that we should also talk about as to what we want to do with that. Yeah, yeah. Do we, do we need to have that if we have the criteria in place? Maybe it's just the energy committee, or maybe it's just, uh, you know, it, it wouldn't have to be a formal meeting necessarily. You have so much time to decide on this? A couple hours. About an hour and a half. Well, uh, what would we gain by having another meeting? I'm just the, nothing. Yep. No, no, yeah, I, I agree with you, Fred. We, we just, I mean, if one person by themselves applying the criteria, yeah. it's, you, it's possible they might make a mistake. It might be possible they have a question. What did that criteria mean? And it might be nice for them to be able to consult with uh, other people who were on this meeting, which would be the energy committee and the select board. Um, but that wouldn't have to be a formal meeting. We wouldn't be, I presume we would not be changing the criteria that we've, uh, uh, so I hope it doesn't sound like I'm bragging, so thoughtfully put forward. But just Brian, if yeah. let's just say by, by some, some random chance, both Joyce and I are on that call, should we not post it just to be safe? So what I have from, from Colonial is that there's gonna be a call from 1.30 to 2.30 and um, we need to have a signatory for each town to be available and authorized to sign a contract by 3.30. So we have an hour after, assuming the phone call ends at, when they say it will, we'll, ha we'll have an hour for somebody to sign, or fill it out, sign it, and scan it and email it back to them. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, Joyce, you and I were on a call earlier today and we didn't post it, so we're fine. No, we didn't deliberate either, so. No. Deliberate, right? well, I'll be on just for curiosity, right? But, um, <clears throat> sure. So I, I would say whatever best practice is.
but we wouldn't expect it to be a formal meeting or, or to need to be further deliberation on that. Um, now, my dad always said, don't, he was a salesman, don't sell past the close. So I'm not going to say anything um, that would <laughs> violate that. I just did remember that there was one additional criteria the town specified that I forgot to mention, which was that even though Massachusetts allows biomass under class one, the town said they don't want any biomass in their class one offering. So it will, it will not involve any carbon-based renewable sources. So that was just in case someone would be worried about that loophole, uh, it was closed. Yeah. And so we are designating Brian to sign. Yes. Well, I think I, uh, I would make a motion yeah, that we designate Brian <coughs> to sign and uh, encourage him to seek um, any advice he would like on the day of. I, I'm going to plan to be in on the call and would be available to uh, bounce, bounce things off of. I'll second Joyce's motion. Okay. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? John? Yes. Brad? Yes. Me? Yes. Oh, I put my hand up over here. Sorry. Okay. Oh, very good. Now. All right. Thank you very much. We appreciate uh, the time you've put into this deliberation. Okay. Well, appreciate your time you're putting into it as well. Great night. You're welcome. Thank you. Good night. Right, Joyce, it's 820 just as a heads up. <laughs> I, oh, yeah. I know it's 820. Uh, all right, we've got um, uh, a whole other page here we can get through, uh, I hope quickly, um, our COVID-19 state of emergency. We need to review our um, directive limiting work in town buildings, uh, directive on employee pay, uh, emergency order restricting public access to town buildings. Um, my understanding is there's not a great reason to change any of those immediately. Um, through our next meeting is uh, it's like the last week in May, isn't it? 27th. Yes, yeah, 27th. Um, and uh, do we need to change the date on the uh, employee pay directive? Yeah, yeah. The you know the governor they they put out framework that talks about how they're going to reopen different mm -hmm. sectors of the economy without uh, I didn't find it very useful but yeah, it, it did I agree. Out, um, universal workplace safety standards that that we're gonna work to implement that we're gonna have to work to implement um, presumably there'll be decisions before the 18th that's when that's when the current I believe that's when the current stay-at-home order and closure order ends um, likely there'll be modifications to that assuming you know, the public health metrics keep trending downward. Um, we've had some internal, just some, some internal emails back and forth as to what, what might need to take place to reopen the town offices to the public. Um, and that's something that, um, that we're still reviewing. Um, so originally I was thinking that, hey, we need an energy committee select board meeting May 20th, so let's talk about it then but it doesn't seem like we need that. Yeah. Uh, overall, quickly, I know we're, it's been a long time already tonight, but yeah. uh, uh, aside from, you know, internal changes in the town offices, I don't know that our operations overall are gonna change too much um, with mm -hmm. the, the highway department and the police department and the fire department. We're gonna continue doing what we're doing. Um, uh, the question is, when do we, when are we allowed to, and, and when can we reopen town offices? But I don't know that necessarily needs to happen next week. Um, yeah. so, we just wait for the governor and then make a decision when we meet. No harm, no foul, foul by extending what we're doing a, a week beyond what the gov when the governor makes his, his announcement. Right, yeah, and I think during the, during the next two week period, I, um, we should, I and the other people at the town offices, we, we started a discussion, but we should finalize what that's going to look like um, yeah. and, and what 
you got to balance people's comfort levels with, you know, they're different. Everybody's different in terms of yeah. the risks and, and health conditions and those types of things. So it's not something we're going we're gonna to slap together quickly, but yeah. it's definitely doable. So if we want to wait until the 27th, I think that would, that would be fine. Um, so do we need to extend our policies we have now on building closures and all that till the 27th? I think that they're, um, all of them except the employee pay directive have a, an open-ended date that we just come, they're in force until we say they're not in force. Okay. Uh, the employee pay directive, we've been just putting a new date on it each time. Right. Um, yeah. and right. For, okay. Uh, I, the pay period cycle, um, it seems like that says to the, do we just say to the 27th, which is our next meeting? Yeah. That be? Yep. Okay. All right. Then um, the only one we need to take action on will be that one. So I would move that we change the, extend the date on the employee pay directive through uh, May 27th. Second. All those in favor, John? Yes. Fred? Yes. Joyce? Yes. Okay. Um, second item under COVID-19 is to discuss any updates to the annual town election or annual town meeting. Um, should I, Brian, do you want to start with that or? Um, yeah, so uh, I emailed you what um, Joyce had, I think I emailed it to everybody, what Joyce had done, the research at the, at the, the gymnasium for the elementary school, and I took a look at the um, what we have for voter turnout in the past several years, um, which is, I don't think we're going to, at a max, we would probably see 120. Um, but I think that's. Uh, uh, I think we should prepare for overflow in the cafeteria um, because uh, the, the gymnasium would be just over 100 people could realistically fit there. That is budgeting some room for FCAT um, and um, using kind of a, what they might call a triangular or, or a hexagonal grid to, to space out chairs and using just the bottom row and the top row and staggered on the, um, on the bleachers. So um, that, and if you add the cafeteria, you get another roughly 40 spots so we could uh, confidently have something like 140 people um, if we have overflow in the cafeteria. Uh, the school has a smart TV uh, that's on wheels and it's about as big as like a regular like a classroom smart board. Um, so a pretty big screen that we could roll into the cafeteria and we'd have to double check how to hook that up into FCAT signal, but I think that's uh, that's a matter of figuring that out in advance and making sure we have the right cables uh, there to do it. Uh, the other the backup on that would be if they're um, they would be live streaming the town meeting itself, we could have that live stream going in the next room. We'd probably want to do it with the sound off because the sound will be delayed on the live stream. Um, but those are just technical issues that uh, we can work out with FCAT, I think. Okay, looking at the, what I remember of the drawings, I thought the, the gym was, was it 85 people you could hold? And then no. I get that up right now. The, the gym uh, on the floor, on the wooden floor, yeah. could hold up to da -da -da, uh, 92. If you put it on a hexagonal grid, um, okay. if you did it on a square grid, you could only fit eighty-four. Okay. Joyce, does your does your diagram put the moderator and the select board and the finance committee up on the stage? Um, probably couldn't fit all of those on the stage. Normally, we have the moderator on the stage. We okay. have a projection screen on the stage. I don't know if we'll need that this year. Um, and sometimes the town clerk is also up on the stage. Um, and then the select board and finance committee are below. I think the stage is, um, I, when I asked Kristen for all these, uh, um, these dimensions, um, she said the stage would, could fit about four people at six feet apart. Okay. 
All right, never mind that. So it, it wouldn't be very practical. I was just trying to expand options. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Have we done any more to, to look at, uh, say, quant quant facilities? I haven't had a chance to reach out to Ann yet, no. Because they're, they're saying they have, what, they can hold 200 in the, in the main building, and that's, what, 4,000 square feet? What, what's the square footage of the, of the, of the gym? No. Well, let me get my calculator out. Because it's 84 um, by 47. And that doesn't include the bleachers. Yeah, 70. That's about 4,000. The 39, 48, then plus the bleachers is uh, a little more space. So it's comparable in size to the gymnasium. And, and our gymnasium can hold 300 people if you don't have to socially distance. Right. Right. So um, sounds like it might be comparable in square footage. All right. Okay. And then we have the overflow space right next door in the cafeteria. Okay. But we also have the added expense of what, buying more covering or canvas for the, for the gym floor? If we, Is that our expense or? We can make that an investment. I think that would be, I would think of it as an investment. Right, and, and my guess is that, that the uh, state's emergency COVID fund would, would, um, would, would pay for that uh, because it is a response to the need to social distance. Yeah, I know they have, they have that one they already have. So maybe if buying a few more of those seems, I mean, if we're starting now, and we're looking uh, um, a month or so away, a month or five weeks away for a town meeting, then that should be enough time to get to get that. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, we know the school, we've used the school, FCAT's familiar with it. Yeah. I, I I would feel better about that than trying to do something, you know, in a parking lot or I don't know at the Northfield Drive-In or whatever. Some of the funny things you're reading about uh, towns doing. Um, I mean, I think half the town would get lost if we tried to go to the Northfield Drive-In, honestly. Um, but uh, it's for sale anyway. We can buy it. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sure the, co the federal COVID funds. Federal COVID money, yeah. Mm, yeah. Sure. Be creative. Right. Okay. Let's continue. So uh, I guess that's is that a decision then? Um, yeah. Discuss any updates. So does that says it sounds like we've decided on the school to be the location then, un, unless and until we have some other information that says we should look elsewhere. That's my, that's my thought. Okay. All right. It sounds like we're done with that one then. Um, old business. Uh, we've got the agreement for services with FERCOG um, to help us with construction bids. Um, is there any discussion of that? Okay. Is, we're hearing that is, I there, a cost? is there a cost to this? Yeah, it's nine hundred dollars. Okay. We have we have the money figured into the for the money for the project. Okay, I'd hear I'd entertain a motion. Okay, motion to uh, enter agreement with FERCOG for the bids just on Plain Road sidewalk. Okay, I'll second that. All those in favor, John? Yeah. Fred? Yes. Joyce? Yep. Okay. Um, the next is to discuss and vote to enter into a contribution and donation agreement with Smith College for Poplar Hill Road. My understanding is we agree we get 60K towards the project. If we don't agree, then we're turning away 60K for that project. Hmm. Let's yeah. deliberate. Hmm. I wonder which one we should do. Mm. I guess the only comment I had, the, I saw the agreement, it, it didn't say what the total project cost was. Do we have any idea, Brian? I'm, I'm waiting for two things from Keith on this. One is total project costs and one are the, are the specs in Exhibit A. Um, 
he thinks it'll be right around sixty thousand dollars. Anything that's over would be covered with Chapter ninety. So that would be the the total, not just their, well, the total project. Okay. Yeah, it would. It, this is something they're going to do uh, in house. So obviously, if we want to talk about costs, there's costs absorbed through the budget and what we pay them for for the salaries, but. Um, it's going to be around sixty thousand, is what he's what he's figuring between the drainage and the resurfacing. Okay. Okay. Make a motion that we enter into uh, uh, approve. I guess motion approve the contribution and donation agreement with Smith College for Poplar Hill Road. Second. Okay. All those in favor, John. Yes. Fred. Yes. Joyce, yes. Okay. Um, and then last under old business is to review the list of double utility poles remaining in town as submitted by the highway superintendent. So I can, I'll reach out to Eversource and it sounded like most of these are Verizon. Um, Eversource okay. has moved their, moved their equipment and the wires off and they left Verizon and whoever else might be on the polls, no, and then they don't do it. Yeah, okay. All right, so that's gonna be taking care of new business. To consider the, a proposal from Earthlight Solar and Energy Solutions submitted by the Facilities Director for Frontier and Union 38 for lighting and energy efficiency improvements at the Waitley Elementary School. So this showed up in my email inbox one day and I had no idea it was coming. Um, okay. But there's a proposal for um, lighting upgrades and um, upgrades to the motors for the walk-in freezer and walk-in cooler. Um, I was pretty skeptical at first because when somebody tells you it's free, it's not usually free. Yeah. Um, but I reached out to our, our liaison at Eversource and they ran it by um, their energy efficiency department and Eversource who works with these vendors. Earthlight is a, um, I don't know what, pre-qualified or whatever, pre-certified mm -hmm. vendor, Eversource contractor. Um, and they reviewed the proposal and they said that Eversource would pay the entire cost for the upgrades. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I don't know that there is a downside. W what gave me pause first is a part of the contractor says, if the energy efficiency um, rebates from every source don't cover the complete cost, the town agrees to pay the cost. That's what gave me pause at first. Mm. Um, but with every source agreeing to. Uh, they agreed in writing. Yeah, that's my question. Um, I have an email in writing that they will. I, I think we should get it in 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 ink writing. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm nervous for the same reason you just said. Yeah, my initial reaction was looking at the lights that that they're proposing. There are a lot, a lot of them are under cabinet lights and not lights that I would consider used often. Um, but I can get, I'll get something in writing. Okay. Brian, the, the agenda says lighting and if energy efficiency improvements. Is it more just lighting, or are uh, there other non-lighting improvements? Yeah, there are improvements to the. Um, for the motors to the walk-in uh, walk refrigerator. Oh, right, okay. mm -hmm. um, I have mixed feelings about, I, I mean, there's companies like this that go around and try mm -hmm. to catch a building and, and tell you they're gonna make all these upgrades and they're gonna tell you the utilities are gonna pay for it. And it, it's yeah. this company that is one of these companies that does that. Right. Um, that's sort of what their business is. And presumably there was some vetting done by the facilities director at Union 38, but that I'm, I would be, I'd be happier if we had something in writing from the electric company. Okay. And, yeah. and I know that they've done this. I believe they, they did this for all, all five schools. Um, okay. But still it, just to be completely honest, it makes me a little uneasy. <laughs> okay. But, no, I understand. I, uh, but I was going to ask that question, and then you brought it up. Yeah, it, if if it is indeed true that Eversource will pay for these upgrades, and we'll see reduced 
energy costs at the yeah. school then, I think. You know, and in fairness, it is a pre-approved vendor of a, of a very large company. So, right, and, but then why do they need the uh, clause in there that says we'll pay for it? I know, I know. I'm, 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 I'm just I saying that I ink through that one and sign it, sign it with that one crossed out. Right, my my trust is 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 almost there, but I think we need the ink. You don't trust Eversource. That's fair. <laughs> okay. All right. So, right. so you know what we'll do on so that'll come up at another meeting, I guess. Yeah. Um, and next, under, uh, second under new business to consider a request to extend the time for employees to use banked vacation time and yep. to increase the amount of allowed carryover from fiscal 20 to 21 due to COVID-19. Um, my understanding is that there are some employees who really haven't been able to take vacation because of kind of the increased load um, that uh, the new working environment has, has had on us. Um, uh, so this would be a, ge uh, a gesture might not be the right word, but I'll use it. It would be a gesture, uh, toward those hardworking folks to allow them to carry over some of that vacation time into the following year when we may expect they would be able to take a well-deserved rest. Well, and, and on top of that, Joyce, honestly, it, what fun is a vacation right now, even if you could take it? And I think I think that's a, a a valid reason to extend it because it's not like they can go to the Cape for a week. It's not like they can go to you know. Yeah. They, well, there's that nothing part to is do. that part I'm most concerned about because people can, you can have vacation at home. It's just that you're not working. Right, right? But I, I, the point is we should do this. Yeah. Um, Fred, do you have any comments? No, I, I agree with okay. extending it. So I move that we extend the time for employees to use bank vacation time. Uh, and to increase the amount of allowed carryover vacation time, if I understand correctly, the uh, allowed carryover would be uh, a certain number of hours, Brian? Would be yeah, 40 right hours. Now, employees are allowed to carry over 80. So what we so what I'd recommend for that is that they'd be allowed to carry over an additional 40 hours. Okay. And, so, then, and then in terms of the old vacation leave, because this all happened because the town – you had to work 12 months and then the town would give you a lump sum vacation to spend the next year. So when we switched in fiscal year 2017 to an accrual system, all those employees had, the ones who had been here the longest, had five weeks of vacation into that bank. Yeah. Gave three years to spend it. Um, and some of them have hard, they had to spend that five, five weeks plus the five weeks they accrue every single fiscal year. So yeah. Okay, so this gives them a little more time to use up that that banked amount. Um, so we're increasing the allowed carryover by 40 hours, and Just, it's supposed to be this fiscal year 20 going into 21. Yeah. Okay, so and it's time to use the bank time for an additional 12 months. Okay. Second. All, right. um, all those in favor, John? Yeah. Fred? Yes. Me? Yes. All right, and this is gonna part's gonna take the longest town administrator updates. Yeah, I got a lot. Um, <laughs> we requested extension of our MVP grant. That's the MVP planning grant. Um, I sent Jonathan. We had emails about this before. There's the, in order to qualify as an MVP community, you're supposed to have either two four-hour work in-person workshops or one eight-hour in-person workshop. Um, it was originally supposed to happen in January. Burkhog, um postponed that on us, and then we were supposed to have it in March, and, well, you know yep. the rest. Why was it postponed in January, Brian? I'll have to look back at my emails. Um, we originally had a date for, I think it was January 16th or something, um, and I think it was a staffing issue. They requested that. Let me double check, but it was their request to delay it. Okay. Because it, cause we can do this via Zoom, correct? Um, I recently saw guidance about about that. Um, so yeah, we'll take a look at that. Okay, it should be done. We should, I, I guess my point is we gotta push for this to happen sooner rather than later. I agree. Uh, because we have culverts that need replacement now. Yep. Yep. Um, in your report, I think that's almost done. Um, and I think Joyce and Amy will get together on when you wanna talk about the dedication um, without revealing anything. 
course. Oh, okay, I it's like a big secret. Um, so speaking of culverts, this is, we submitted a, a grant for culverts. Um, this is the one that we typically submit to EOEA. Um, mm -hmm. in, the, in the past couple of years, we've submitted it for, the, for a culvert on Williamsburg Road. We decided to submit the one um, on Christian Lane uh, next to the um, next to the castaways um, that qualified. So um, hopefully that'll be a little bit more competitive, but there's not a lot of money um, okay. for them to award. And this this would be for, for, for design of that. That was submitted uh, for this week. And then Waynesburg Road Bridge Project. Um, as you know, we have the additional funds um, and the contractors looking to um, start some of the shop drawings and, and preliminary stuff that needs to happen there. So um, that should be moving forward as well. Brian, can, yep. can, can somebody be in touch with the owners of the castaways to let them know that their uh, wooden wall is falling down? The fence? Yes. Yeah, somebody literally plowed it. Literally plowed it? I think it got pushed. I think snow got pushed into it. Okay, so. I don't think they've been around very much lately. No, I understand that. But someone needs to be in touch with the plow. I mean, they need to fix it. It's an eyesore. Yep. And I get it's not their fault. But they need to be in touch with the with the company that, that they contract with to do their plowing of their, of their parking lot to have that company fix the, the fence. Okay, I guess at the same time, Brian, if you're going to be talking to them, they need to connect that wall to that uh, enclosed what smoking area, black wall that they made. There's a gap there, and I think the requirement was that it would it would close that up. It would abut to it. Okay. Well, they're not going to be opening anytime soon, so. Right, but if they're fixing a fence, they might as well do both ends, I guess. Right. Okay. All right. It sounds like, um, uh, is that it? Um, I think so. Okay. I have two, I have two quick things. Well, I, Fred, it's got to be really quick because it's our Memorial our Day. entire agenda. And, and One, Memorial Day, I saw the email. I think we need to send something out to uh, to the public to know what we're doing. About? What we're not doing? Yeah, what we're not doing. Uh, how's everybody going to know? Unless you put in an ad in a paper or something. But that's not our auspices, though, Fred. That's, that's a function of, of the Grange and the historical. Well, okay. Okay. The other thing uh, of, of uh, marijuana growing, there's a proposal out in Hatfield and Waitley Town Line. It's been yeah. in the paper. Are we getting information on that? Are we part of that? Well, it's in Waitley. I, we should be. Are we receiving anything, Brian? I haven't seen anything come through. Okay. All right. I was CC'd on an email from that went to the planning board. Um, I don't think it was the same. I don't think it was the same company though. Wasn't the guys who we just talked with two hours ago? Oh. No. No, they said it's different. I think he said someone named Smiraski was going to be putting something in the northern part of Hatfield close to the Waitley border. Um, perhaps abutting the Waitley border. Well, um, it in Waitley. The article said that, I think the article wrongly described it as a continuous lot in Hatfield and Waitley. I think they're probably two separate lots, but it's on the Hatfield side of the line. Uh, okay. I, I don't know. I didn't see any detail other than what's in the in today's newspaper, there's a write-up. Mm -hmm. They've got yeah. to come to us if they want to do something in our town. So I think we just wait for them to play their cards. And until then, what are we going to do? 
Okay. Okay, I did I entertain a motion to adjourn? Oh, yes. Uh, all in favor? John? Yep. Fred? Yes. Joyce? Yes. Good night and good Thank luck. Everybody.